and different people's responses. As we go through this season leading up to Easter, we're going to encounter different people who encountered Jesus and had a different response to Jesus on each step of the way. In current days, we sometimes call this the Stations of the Cross. Now, the Stations of the Cross comes out of a Catholic background, a Catholic perspective. Those who go, they, they reacquaint themselves with the steps that Jesus took from the time of his arrest all the way up to the time until his crucifixion. As a way for them to focus and to pray and to be able to find where Jesus is. And it's a great thing to do during Holy Week or during Lent or especially on Good Friday. It's a time of a reminder of what Jesus went through. So it's just an aid in people being connected closer to Jesus. In fact, it started in the late 1600s, early 1700s and developed from there when it continued on. This series really isn't about those stations of the cross, even though you may have heard about the stations of the cross. This is instead about the journey that Jesus takes to get to Jerusalem, knowing full well that ultimately the cross is going to await him in that journey. And then he sets his eyes and he goes towards that. But more importantly, he's going to take a look at the encounters that when Jesus begins to set his eyes on heading towards Jerusalem, that Jesus has with different people along the way and how they respond to what's happening. Ultimately, what I want to do is make sure that you take a look and say, how do I encounter Jesus as he heads to the cross? And what's my response to Jesus? It's one thing to take a look at what their response is. It's another thing to think of what our response is. We're going to take a look at this biblical story today in the Gospel of Mark. And a lot of times we'll take some look at some insights that you might not realize that God has put in Scripture that helps us to go, oh, that's what he's talking about. Oh, that's how it applies to us. So ultimately, it comes down to this. What's your encounter with Jesus? And how will you respond? Here's the truth of the matter. No one encounters Jesus and leaves without some sort of response. Jesus demands a response. We can turn our back on Jesus, and some have. We can say, run into Jesus' arms and say, oh, I'm with you. Thank you so much. And some have done that. And sometimes we've gone to know Jesus along the way. We sometimes know Jesus. We've run into his arms already. But then we'll try to push Jesus in another direction and say, no, not that way, Jesus. Let's go a different way. No, 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 let's go a different way. These and many, many more responses are things that have happened to people as they've encountered Jesus. In fact, there's another phrase that's out there that you might be aware of as well. And we'll share that after I pray. Let's pray. God, be with me in this sermon. Make it yours and not mine. Let these words communicate your gospel and your love. May they reveal accurately in Scripture who you are and what you're about. And let us understand your love for us. In your praying belief, amen. Well, have you ever heard the phrase, it's time to have a come to Jesus conversation? Okay? Yeah. Now, usually does that bring up a whole lot of good, good thoughts to you? A come to Jesus conversation is usually one of those conversations when a change is expected, in fact, demanded at that point in time. Maybe it's a come to Jesus conversation around a job. Maybe it's a come to Jesus conversation around something in your house. Who knows what it is, but sometimes uh, we have those come to Jesus conversations. I want to tell you about one of the come to Jesus conversations that I had in my lifetime. This encounter was when I was a young man, a, a Todd, and I was just a young kid. Probably I would say we were third or fourth grade, maybe fourth or fifth. I don't know what it was, but it was a good time. And I was with Steve Cheney at his house. Now, Steve Cheney's stories in my home always are stories that end up in some sort of calamity, okay? It just happened every time. And I'll tell you this right now, it's done with the greatest of grace because Steve Cheney, God rest his soul, has already passed away. And I had a part of his funeral just a few years ago. He's a dear, dear friend of mine. But we were over at Steve Cheney's house, and I can't remember if it was a snow day or not. All I know is that we were inside playing. So we had to figure out how to play in different ways. And of course, as young boys, we figured out great ways to play. So we play tag. But you can't just play tag, can you? Okay? So you've got to play tag in a different way. So we figured out how to play tag with wiffle ball bats. Okay? You know those big, long ones that are, that are yellow and plastic and stuff like that? And they're really like easy to swing. And they're kind of soft and light. And so we, but our whole idea of playing tag was not just to tag each other, but to see how many big welts we could raise with each other. You know what I mean? You know? It was just cool. We were trying to like hit each other as hard as we could, you know? And it was all great fun that we are going to do this. So, so here we are in Steve Cheney's living room, okay? And we're chasing each other around the house. Steve's mom is around the house somewhere. We don't know where, and she wishes she'd known. But at any rate, uh, she's not there. So we're chasing each other, and all of a sudden, Steve Cheney comes up to the spot right behind this chair, and I know where he is. And I'm thinking, when he comes up, I'm going to nail him so good. And so I'm walking up like this. 
like this. And Steve pops up from behind the chair. This is my moment. I can hit him right here, raise the biggest thing well ever. And I took one of the greatest swings of my life. If I had been a cub, I'd have hit the ball over the wall on the way of Avenue. Amen? Okay? I mean, it was sweet. It was ready. And I made fantastic contact as it came around. The problem was Steve ducked down. Okay? And so on the other side of Steve was the antique lamp. <laughs> that I made perfect contact with and sit it over the wall on Waveland Avenue that broke into a thousand shards and made this alarming sound at which point Steve's mom comes right into the room and miracle of all miracles we had disappeared it was awesome we were gone who knows where we were we'd gone off into another room we slipped into the closet because surely his mom won't look in a closet Parents, what do you say? First place to look. Amen. So we're in the closet, like praying, oh, Lord Jesus. Oh, Lord Jesus. And then all of a sudden, it was the come to Jesus conversation. You know what I mean? Because all of a sudden, Jesus was in my room, and Jesus was Steve Cheney's mom. Okay? And then there was a problem, because basically, even though the yellow wiffle bats were left in the living room, we basically did not know. I don't know who did it. No. We had no clue. Surely, I don't know how it happened. I don't know anything. Who knows what had happened at that point in time? At that point in time, Jesus calls in reinforcements, okay? Made a phone call to my parents, the Father and the Holy Spirit, okay? <laughs> so my mom and dad come over, and so we meet with the Holy Trinity at that point in time. Now, don't worry about my theology. I don't think my mom and dad are the Father and the Holy Spirit. Don't worry. Uh -uh. It's just a part of the story. But it was the moment when we had to come to Jesus' talk, and I'm still playing pains of him today. <laughs> Needless to say, it was one of those moments that just, you have to respond. And we finally had to confess that we did that and had to help pay for it and all that sort of stuff like that. It was the shriek of Steve's mom that still rings in my ears when you saw that her lamp was gone. It was not a good thing. But it was fun, but it was not a good thing. So this is one of those moments that's a come to Jesus moment. It's in the Gospel of Mark, and it's a part of the background of the Gospel of Mark. Think of the word like this. Think of a pivot. A pivot is when something totally changes. You have years that can be on a pivot, and it goes from going this direction to this direction. And the Gospel of Mark, you have all of these things leading up to chapter 8, and then you have this moment in chapter 8 in which this pivot occurs, and everything is going in a different direction. And so that's the story that we're encountering in Mark chapter 8. It's an important moment of realization and confirmation, and it is the change that takes place. And not only that, it takes place in a place of Caesarea Philippi, where they're up above on a large mountain, and they're looking down over a significant area. So even the place that this story occurs is important, and even where it occurs in the gospel is important. Because basically, in this moment in time, not only does it shift for who Jesus is, but there's a lot of things about the place that are communicating what things Jesus was encountering. So let's look at the scriptures. What does it say in Mark chapter 8, starting at verse 27? It says this, Jesus and his disciples left Galilee and went up to the villages near Caesarea Philippi. Now that's a pretty significant distance, even by car. So there was an intentionality of leaving from Galilee and going to Caesarea Philippi. Again, by car, it takes you a good long distance. There were not cars back then, in case you're not aware. Okay? And, and so they went up to the villages near Caesarea Philippi. And near Caesarea Philippi, they're looking down over this whole area that is a part of the Jewish uh, land and part of the Israelite land and what they know. And, and, and also in Caesarea Philippi, there was this uh, connection to the Roman Empire as well. So Jesus is encountering what's happening in the Jewish world and what's happening in the Roman world as well, even in Caesarea Philippi. It says this, As they were walking along, he asked them, Who do people say that I am? So here's this concept. They're getting to Caesarea Philippi. They're walking along. They're looking out over this area. The disciples have kind of drawn away with Jesus. They're away from the busyness of ministry. And Jesus is just having some conversation. And he asks them this question, Who do people say that I am? And the disciples, as a group, they're kind of saying, well, here's some things we're saying. This is easy enough. Uh, some say that you're John the Baptist, who's, you know, here again. 
And he's well, we remember that. Some say he's Elijah. Others say you're just one of the prophets. So this is one of those easy moments when you ask them the question. They can say, well, some say this and some say this. It's not a big deal. And you know what it's like when someone asks you, what are other people saying? What do other people say about that? That's an easy question to answer because you can answer what somebody else wants to do. Then, of course, Jesus takes it a step further. Then he asks them, but who do you say that I am? Now it's different, isn't it? Because it's not just what do others say. Who do you say that I am? And so then amongst the disciples, there's this, what's called uneasy silence, you know? You know, when someone asks you a question and, like, no one in the group wants to say anything, I was like, ooh, what do we do here? So uneasy silence. How to respond. It's one thing to say what others think. It's another thing for us. Who's going to say the wrong answer? Well, Peter, of course. Peter's the one who has the right answer. Peter's ready to step up. He's the kid in class who always raises his hand first. You know what I mean? He's the kid who's always ready to go. And then he steps up and he says, you're the Messiah. Ding, 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 ding. Right answer. Good job. Gold star. Peter's excited. All right. This is good. Victorious moment right then. And all the time I'm going, eh, Peter always gets the right answer. Ah, thank you. Messiah, whatever. Good. <laughs> then interesting. And I'm not going to really focus on this next part here because it's a whole other sermon in itself. But Jesus warned them not to tell anyone about him. Why? We're going to understand more about this Messiah business, about how dangerous it is. That's part of the reason. But like I said, that's a whole other sermon just on verse 30 in and of itself. But I'm more interested in what happens next. It says this. Then Jesus began to tell them, the Son of Man must suffer many terrible things. That's where this pivot occurs. So here we are at Caesarea Philippi. The location is in view. It's a location from the Jewish perspective, as I've said. We also know that it was a location for a Roman reality. And it was hard to get from where they were before. So Jesus was intentional about coming to that place and pulling away from the busy encounter. Interestingly enough, Caesarea Philippi also had a Roman temple there for a new Roman god, and it was the newest pagan god they had who happened to be the emperor himself. So, we have this challenge in this location where Jesus is when they ask who he is, and there's everything there to say, is he a part of what this Israelite nation has been about? How do they become a great nation again? Or is he about the Roman government rulers instead? Both of those things are present in that location. <coughs> Doesn't shout it out, but it's there. So when Jesus asks this question, this general response comes from the disciples, and Peter then steps up and he talks for the disciples. And he is the one who says he's the Messiah. What was Peter talking about when he talked about the Messiah? See, we can't read it like we know the story today. We go, oh, that's Jesus. He's the Messiah. He's the one who goes to the cross. He goes all these sort of things. That's not the background that Peter had. Peter instead said, we see the Messiah as divine and, and, and this one who's going to go forward, but he's going to be the Jewish king. He's going to be that person who restores Israel to their national identity the way that it was. And it was a politically dangerous move. And Messiahship was a subversive idea. And the disciples, they had a view for him being the king of Israel. That's what they wanted him to be. But then, that's when Jesus again turns things. He says, The Son of Man must suffer, verse 31, must suffer many terrible things and be rejected by the elders, the leading priests, the teachers of religious law. Here's the thing the Messiah must do. He'll be killed, but three days later he would rise from the dead. And as he talked about this openly with his disciples, Peter took him aside and began to reprimand him for saying such things. So here's the picture. They say he's the Messiah. And Peter's going, yeah, I got it right. And in their mind, they have, this is the king of the Jews. This is the one who will overthrow Rome. This is the one who will make all these things happen. And then what happens is, Jesus says, don't tell anyone. And he begins to say, here's what the Son of has to do. He's got to suffer. He's got to be rejected. He's got to be, in fact, killed and three days later rise from the dead. That is not their view of Messiah. It isn't their idea whatsoever. And so that's why Peter pulls him up and goes, 
Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Jesus, you don't get this idea of Messiah, do you? You know, this is what Messiah is. This is a different way. This isn't what you should be doing. This is not what you're talking about. Jesus, we've got a marketing plan to think about. Jesus, if I'm going to be on your right hand, if I'm going to be the one who's going to be the one who helps you out, this is what it's got to be. Here's what the real Messiah is, Jesus. And Jesus says, no. In fact, notice what it is. After he tells him what the Son of Man must do, and talks openly with his disciples, Peter takes him aside and begins to reprimand him for saying such things. And what's Jesus' response? Huh. Jesus' response is that he turns around, looks at his disciples, and then reprimanded Peter. And what's he said? Get away from me, Satan. He said, you're seeing things merely from a human point of view, not from God's. So Peter goes from having the right answer, raising his hand, getting the gold star, and saying he's the Messiah, to Jesus saying, get thee behind me, Satan. All of a sudden, gold star falls off. Peter's going like, what? Because he had this vision of the Messiah that really wasn't a godly vision. He had this idea that there would be a military takeover. He had this idea that they would topple the Sadducees. They would topple the Pharisees. They would take over. They would be in charge. But that's not what Jesus was. And so it becomes this question that his response was different than what we needed to do and what we need to experience. And Jesus goes on to teach him. See, we need to think about ourselves. What's our response to Jesus? See, we have Jesus come and be in our life. You know what we want him to be? We want him to be a solver of problems. We want him to be a prince of peace to make everything right in our life. We want him to be this great human teacher and nothing more. We want him to be Superman, able to zap the world's problems at a moment's notice and be done. We want easy answers with Jesus all at once. The problem is, that isn't quite the way it works. See, we want God to make it all easy. In fact, it tells us in the scriptures that Jesus tells us to seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you. And we're ready for those things to be given to us, but the reality is we oftentimes see this in a backwards way. We see it like this. We want everything the world has to offer, and then we seek God, and we want Jesus to be second, third, fourth, or tenth in line. We try to make Jesus fit into the world and the reality is, Jesus is the world. Amen? That's the difference. That's the difference. So what's Jesus say? Jesus turns around and looking at his disciples, he recommended, recommended Peter, get away from me, Satan, he said. You're seeing this thing merely from a human point of view, not from God's. So the question becomes, what, what is God's point of view? And it says then in verse 34, Then calling the crowd and joined his disciples, he said, and now the crowd was probably, we had 70 more who were more in the area, maybe more than that, but he calls them up to be with the disciples. So he addresses not just Peter, not just the disciples, but everyone else then at that point in time. And remember, he's saying it around Caesarea Philippi. He sees the whole area of the Jewish nation. He sees the Roman challenge that's there with the temple. And then he's speaking to the disciples. He said, if any of you wants to be my follower, you must give up your own way, take up your cross, and follow me. If you try to hang on to your life, you'll lose it. But if you give up your life for my sake and for the sake of the good news, you'll save it. And what do you benefit if you gain the whole world but lose your soul? Here's the challenge. The following of Jesus undoes the dark evil that's gripped this world. So Jesus has come to take the evil that came in through sin and undo that and set it in a different path. And see, when we follow Jesus, it's not just about making a few adjustments. See, sometimes we accept Jesus as our Savior and say, okay, if I just adjust one or two things, I'll be good. It's just a few adjustments. No, it's about giving up your own way. Sometimes we think following Jesus is about just making a few changes, picking up a devotional, maybe praying occasionally. No, it's about taking up your cross. See, Jesus isn't just leading the disciples or us on a pleasant afternoon hike. It's about following Jesus. And it's not just a walk that's pleasant and easy. It's a walk into danger and risk. He says, if you try to hang on to your life, you'll lose it. But if you give up your life for my sake and the sake of the good news, guess what? You'll save it. See, these things that we encounter with Jesus, in fact, Peter's response and your response is pretty challenging. And so what's interesting is put yourself in the disciples' shoes. Find a place where you can pull away with Jesus. Just like he went up to Caesarea Philippi. He was away from the busyness of ministry. 
When you're at Caesarea Philippi, when you're that place where you're pulled away, look at the challenges that are coming at your life. Maybe it's the way that the world says you should behave. Maybe it's the way your family told us you were supposed to be. But instead, what does Jesus reveal, reveal for you to see about yourself? And how do you put Jesus first in your life? How do you not just try to say, I want everything the world has to offer and get a little bit of Jesus too? It needs to be, I want everything Jesus has to offer. And then, as a result of following him and taking up my cross, then I'll be able to gain the whole, the whole opportunity of having my soul with Jesus. It's in that place and that moment. So, I think we're all oftentimes a lot like Peter. But we get asked the question, who do you say that I am? Yeah, we want him to be our Savior. That's Jesus. He's my Savior. But do we follow him and take our cross and follow him? That's the question. So my hope and my prayer is that you can do that. That you can take up your cross and follow Jesus. And realize that as we go to Jerusalem, go to the place where Jesus follows the cross, that there indeed we do pick it up and follow with him in that way. And let it be central to our lives. So, sometimes we have a come to Jesus conversation. And sometimes that come to Jesus conversation can be a little bit like a kid in the closet going, oh man, I knew I did wrong, I'm in serious trouble, and I gotta confess. But sometimes that come to Jesus conference conversation is very different. We run into his arms and we find him loved because we feel like we're not loved before. Sometimes that come to Jesus conversation is different because we say, I want Jesus to be like this. And we realize, that isn't where Jesus takes us. He takes us down a different path. I don't know where you are. My hope and thought is that this week, you'll look at where you are and say, if Jesus were to say, come and follow me, have I picked up my cross and followed him? That's the question for this week. Let's pray. Lord, thanks for meeting us wherever we are. 